So, in the previous lecture we were looking at the linear quadratic Gaussian team and I had mentioned to you uh, that the this particular team has the has the property that every uh, every uh, person by person optimal solution is also team optimal. Now, uh, remember that if uh, the, the the in a linear quadratic uh, in a linear quadratic team what we have is that uh, the cost is quadratic in the uh, in the actions of the players. So, it is a it is a it is quadratic in uh, so, it is a quadratic function like this u transpose q u where u is the vector formed by stacking up all the vector actions of the n players. Q here is a matrix uh, which is positive definite. Uh, the, the dependence on psi is linear in this sort of way. The information that that uh, player i receives is a, is, a is a linear function of psi. So, it is some h i times psi where h i is a full row rank matrix. And what one has to choose is u i which is a function of y i u i equal to gamma i of y i. Uh, now, because of because of this particular uh, nature of this problem. So, because u is, uh, is, uh, is because l is strictly convex in because uh, q is positive definite l is strictly convex in u and because it is quadratic it is also continuously differentiable in u and this holds for each fixed psi. Right. Now, if psi itself is Gaussian that means it is a Gaussian vector then in that case we have a linear quadratic Gaussian team. All right. Now, otherwise it is just some linear quadratic team. Now, in, uh, in either case because L is L satisfies the hypothesis of this theorem here. So, if you have a linear if you have a, a static team in which uh, u 1 to u n uh, l of u 1 to u n comma psi has the property that l is continuously differentiable and strictly convex in u 1 to u n for each fixed psi then every person by person optimal solution is also team optimal right. So, then so consequently every person by person optimal solution of uh, of your of the uh, of of this particular team problem this is your lq this is this the lqg team would also be a team optimal right so uh, it's uh, it's easy to see that these hypotheses are being satisfied the most uh, the, the the this follows from the positive definiteness of q the quadraticness of this and the fact that h the information structure is that in yi is a function of only psi so why uh, so this problem is therefore a static team problem all right. So now let's come to uh, uh, let's come to uh, the special case of the linear quadratic Gaussian team. Uh, this the above result has only told us that every person by person optimal solution is team optimal. It hasn't told us what the nature of the of the solution actually is. So now in order to to do that, let us uh, let's let us look at the following. Make a few observations here. So we. So the cost that we have, let's uh, we can we can write out this this cost in the in this following form. So we can write out. Uh, so our cost is has the form u transpose uh, u transpose q u plus um, u trans u transpose s times psi. Now we can. It turns out that one can write out this cost in the fol in a, a in the following sort of form, where you have you write u minus uh, let's say q inverse q inverse another vector r, which could potentially depend on psi times q and u minus q inverse another vector r that depends potentially depends on psi plus uh, plus some other stuff which does not depend on u. Independent independent of u. All I have done here is really completed the squares. So, I noticing that 
the expression on the left here is uh, is actually a, a, a convex quadratic it means it is very much uh, very close to being a perfect square I have sort I all I have done here is basically completed the squares. completed the squares. So, this complete completion of squares can, uh, can all you would have seen it in scalars you can but you can also do it in vectors. Another way of thinking about this is that so notice that Q here is some matrix which is potentially a dense matrix, but it is positive definite and it is symmetric. So, I, I forgot to mention Q is positive definite and symmetric. Uh, it is positive definite, uh, we do not need it symmetric. So, Q uh, notice that Q here is a is potentially a dense matrix. So, thanks to this Q ca you can uh, uh, we can uh, we can write Q using its eigenvalue uh, eigenvalue decomposition and uh, and find that Q can in fact be broken down into uh, some a matrix like this into something like u minus u uh, oh sorry into p p capital lambda uh, p capital lambda t. So, this this uh, where this capital lambda is a diagonal matrix. diagonal matrix of eigenvalues eigenvalues of q so because of this uh, this kind of uh, this kind of transformation uh, or com or what i just called completing the squares what one can do is basically write uh, write out this the the expression that you have on the left in this sort of form now once we have written it in this sort of form in fact we late, you can later see that this this r in fact is actually linear the it turns out here in this case because because of this because of the dependence uh, uh, because of this particular uh, uh, because this term is linear in psi it actually turns out that r itself is linear in psi. So, this itself turns out to be linear in psi. So, once this is linear in psi and psi itself is a Gaussian vector then this cost now starts resembling the cost here starts resembling is similar to is akin to a mean square estimation. It is akin to a mean square estimation of a Gaussian of a Gaussian uh, given given another vector which is Gaussian. So, it is as if what one is doing is basically doing a mean square estimation of some kind of uh, Gaussian vector given the information given uh, the knowledge of another Gaussian vector. And these Gaussian vectors how are they derived? Well, they are all derived from lin taking linear combinations of the same Gaussian vector psi. So, consequently the vector that we are estimating is and the vector that whose uh, through which we are getting the information they are all jointly Gaussian. And therefore, the, the theory of jointly Gaussian random variables applies and consequently what we find is that what each player is doing in the, uh, the optimal strategy for each player to do in this problem turns out to be to play a linear a linear strategy. So, the so the our main result we find is that u u i equal to some lambda i times y i is the optimal strategy. And the way to prove this actually goes through using the earlier result. So, so if you assume that each 
uh, each uh, e each player is playing a linear strategy then it becomes then all of these uh, then all the use also become all the other use become linear functions of uh, uh, linear functions of psi so once all the once the uh, once all players other than player i play linear strategies the uh, the strategies of the other players become linear functions of psi and the optimal action for player i then is to pick uh, is uh, is to do some sort of a mean square estimation based on the cost that is involved and that then also becomes a linear function of its own information so the, which means that if the others if uh, if the others uh, play a linear strategy it becomes optimal for for player i to also play a linear strategy and then this is this uh, from this it one can argue that the uh, that a particular type of tuple of linear strategies is actually team is actually person by person optimal and once it's person by person optimal we know from the previous result that it is also it is also team optimal so one basically argues that if u j star is equal equal to lambda j times uh, times y j for all j not equal to i then u i star then the optimal action for player i is to also play uh, a linear strategy. So, if then u i star equal to this is uh, is optimal so a linear strategy is uh, is optimal in response to lambda j for j not equal to i right so in a, so therefore it becomes optimal for all the other players to, uh, for for the other players to play linear strategies so this ensures therefore that that uh, person by person uh, optimal uh, linear strategies are person by person optimal and therefore linear strategies are also team optimal now this this actually is one of the uh, uh, one, one set of results which are uh, which are rather uh, 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 where it is once one problem class in which the uh, static team problem has actually been solved very cleanly uh, not too many other results like this are known the the lqg static team is therefore uh, also one of the most widely applied uh, uh, structures in in team decision theory so with this we have concluded uh, with this we have concluded our, our uh, study of, of static team problems uh, and come to the conclusion of uh, with, uh, with, a, with a study of, of linear quadratic uh, linear quadratic Gaussian teams. So from here now we will go into problems that are of a, of a dynamic nature and we will study those uh, uh, we will study those problems in, in a little bit more depth. And we will see how a version of the Witzenhausen problem actually corresponds to uh, corresponds to what looks like a communication problem. Let us now cast our mind back to the Witzenhausen problem. So the Witzenhausen problem, remember the, the what what do we know about it? We know that it's a linear quadratic Gaussian problem. We know that it has non-classical information pattern. We know that uh, in that the optimal controller for that problem are not linear so some kind of nonlinear controllers are optimal uh, we also know uh, that we have uh, that the that there is a dual effect because of the kind of information structure that we have there is a dual effect in this problem and finally what we do not know about the problem is that we do not know the form uh, of the optimal controller we just know it's something nonlinear but we do not know what it is now let's let us cast uh, think back about this and uh, let's recall again the role that the first controller plays in the in the witzenhausen problem which is what we have understood by the term dual effect 
So, in the in the Witzenhausen problem you have so this is Witzenhausen so this is the Witzenhausen problem. So, you have a, a source uh, or we have an uh, the initial state as x 0 this is being seen by the first controller who takes an who applies a control gamma 1 and produces an action right that is his action. Now, this action we denoted by u 1. Now, this action had two different effects this action was present in the cost function of the controller. So, it is present here in the cost and therefore, it has this is what we consider as the direct effect. So, this is the direct effect of this of this action and because that is what directly affects the affect the cost function. The other indirect effect let us say the indirect effect is that gamma gamma 1 came uh, is that uh, gamma gamma 1 was also present was also impacting the information of the second controller right. So, because through through the information of the second controller. So, so this was the indirect effect. So, when you came to the second controller the, the information of of gamma 2 was affected was dependent on gamma 1 right and then when and then gamma 2 chose its action as a function of this function gamma 1 right and this is what we called the dual effect right? this was a manifestation of the dual effect. Now, the we have seen uh, before that therefore, as a result of this dual effect there is a dilemma for the choice as far as the choice of gamma 1 is concerned. Gamma 1 can say well I want to minimize the direct cost by choosing the op by choosing the right kind of action u 1 that affects the cost directly or I can say well I want to uh, uh, also focus I want to uh, uh, to minimize the indirect cost which is that affects the information of gamma 2 which then will affect the action of gamma 2. So, so the dilemma for gamma 1 is to choose the right balance between the direct cost and the indirect cost right. So, the dilemma for gamma 1 is striking is in striking the right balance between the direct cost and indirect cost. Now, in addition to what I just mentioned that we know about the Witzenhausen problem, we also know a few other things. We have also seen variants of this problem that look that we were able to solve right. So, we have seen variants which we have been able to solve rather easily. So, what was one of those variants? One of those variants was wherein was one where the second controller did not have uh, a non classical this is one of the variants was where the problem did not have non classical information where the we, we somehow gave access of x 0 to the second controller. So, this was one of the variants we considered one of our one variant was one variant was gamma 2 as access as access to x 0 
has access to the initial state. In other words, it has access to the information that uh, that that the first controller has when it takes its action, right? So, so as a result, this becomes the which makes it a classical information structure. Now, because this is uh, this has a this is now a classical information structure. Now we can say that. We were, we were actually able to solve the problem rather easily. We found here that we found what the optimal controllers there were and we in fact found the optimal cost as well under those controllers. So, now what do we learn from this particular, uh, this particular example? What this we learn is that if this information here of x0 is supplied to, uh, to, to, uh, to gamma 2, then, then in that case, the optimal choice, uh, the op finding the optimal controllers is rather easy to do. In other words, this dilemma is rather is is uh, this dilemma between striking the right balance between direct and indirect cost is not that not, not that hard a dilemma. So it's rather it's quite easy to to know what the optimal action then should be, right? So what we find is therefore that. If if the information of the initial state there actually is no dilemma between direct and indirect costs. So, so if the information of x0 is present with gamma 2, then there is no dilemma between direct and indirect cost. Now, what this means is that the root of this dilemma is the lack of lack of knowledge of x0. So, if this x0 could somehow be communicated to a, to gamma 2, then this dilemma uh, uh, goes away and, and therefore, the, in that case the problem the problem becomes rather easy to solve. So, in other words the, the core of the dilemma between uh, for, for controller 1 is really the dilemma between taking the optimal control action and all and between doing a some sort of a communication which is the com which is communicating enough about x0 so that gamma 2 can then take its action rather it can take its next action and together these two actions turn out to be optimal so the the so the crux of the dilemma the crux of of the dilemma in the Witsenhausen problem is, is, is the is the dilemma between between communication, between control and communication. This is what we find. So, thanks to this we can now ask ourselves, we can ask an interesting question. So, is the if this is really the dilemma between control and communication, then there ought to be extreme cases of this particular problem in which either one of the effects is present or the other effect is present, right. So, what are the extreme cases then of the Witsenhausen problem? So, the there are one can talk of two extreme cases. The first is the an extreme first extreme case 
is when you have classical information structure. First extreme case is what is called the classical information structure. Now, why, why is this an extreme case? This is an extreme case because in this case the, 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 the information of the initial state is already available with the second controller. So, the, there, therefore, there is no need for communication. So, in this, in this when, when one has a classical information structure, the, the information of the initial state is already available with the second controller and therefore, there is no need for communication. The other extreme case is, is one where you have pure communication. See the other extreme case is one where when you have pure communication. Now, why is this uh, the other extreme case? See notice that the, the dilemma in the Witzenhausen problem is the dilemma between control and communication. When we take the classical information pattern, we have taken communication out of the picture and the first controller can fo focus only on control. That means, choosing the right control action without bothering about how it is affecting the information of the other agent. Because the information of the other agent is independent of its, if it, uh, of its choice of policy. So, the, the classical inf in this classical information pattern, the, the here in this case the here the, the com communication aspect is irrelevant. Communication is irrelevant and only control matters. So, the uh, controller can focus on only control. In the other case, the other extreme case, which is the case of a pure communication problem, in that case, we what will happen is control is, control has no importance, has no relevance and only communication matters. So, thanks to this what we see is that actually Witzenhausen, the Witzenhausen problem lies somewhere in between these two, the, these two extremes. The one extreme in which communication is irrelevant and only control matters which is the classical information pattern which is where MDPs reside, OEO MDPs reside and so on. So, this is let us say P also the domain of PO MDPs, MDPs and so on. The other extreme is a pure communication problem, where control has no relevance and only and the issue the issue at hand is only communication. Now, I have not yet defined for you what a communication problem really is, but I, I will come to that in the following lectures. But nonetheless, remember that in spirit at least this is what is this is what this is where the Witzenhausen problem finds itself, that it finds itself somewhere tied somewhere between these two extreme cases. And what is fascinating is not only is it some is the Witzenhausen somewhere between these two extreme cases, what is also fascinating is that these two extreme cases are actually well studied problems. The classical information structure is really what we have studied already as Markov decision processes or partially observed Markov decision processes. The other extreme which is a which is the communication problem that is an uh, that is also well studied and that is an instance of that that then is a that that is a, the that is and that is a subject of communication theory so what witzenhausen problem finds itself in between is is sort of in a regime where there is no really no good theory it it finds itself in a regime where which is somewhere in between a communication uh, which between communication theory which is developed solely for the purpose of communication and and, and uh, Markov decision theory, which is which is developed 
assuming a perfect information structure, we, we assuming a classical information structure. So, this is where the Witzenhausen problem finds itself. Now, for the remaining part of the course, what we will see is we will look at since we have already looked at the classical information pattern in depth, for the remaining part of the course, we will focus on this, this aspect, which is the communication aspect. And we will see what, what how exactly is a communication problem can how can that be thought of as an extreme case of the Witzenhausen problem.